the, now the second of a, of a three-parter. Last week, uh, it was a changing Israel and a changing West. This week, we're talking about a changing Israel and changing great power competition. And next week, the final installment will be a changing Israel in a changing Middle East. And just a very kind of quick reminder of some of the key points from last week. So you'll remember I started out by showing this map, which we identified as a representation of something called the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And this map was a, um, an introduction or a kind of trigger alluding to the fact that we are in a, a, a world of, of competition between great powers. It's going to be our theme for today. Uh, and the competition between these powers is over different kinds of things. It's over material stuff. <clears throat> it's a competition for who controls access to raw materials, trade routes, who gets to sell, make what and sell what and where, who controls the technologies of the future, who controls access to what kinds of military technologies uh, and has military superiority. So there's all that kind of competition between great powers over that kind of material stuff. But there's also another dimension to this great power competition is a competition over ideas. And I showed and I read, uh, I showed this image of uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the leaders of China and Russia, respectively. Um, and I read this quotation from a joint statement they made in a summit uh, in February of 2022, where they said, basically, uh, we have our own ideas about what democracy is about. We have our own ideas about human rights um, and we don't accept Western powers like the US or the EU telling us what democracy is, telling us what human rights is, and basically telling us how we should run our countries or how the, the international systems should be run. We have our own values. We have our own ideas. Um, and they're pushing back, obviously, as autocratic regimes, they're pushing back on, they feel very threatened by kind of Western uh, uh, ideas of liberal democracy, liberal internationalism. Uh, and they're pushing back saying, uh, we have our own civilizations, our own values, and they're no less valid than yours. Um, but the contest or the challenge to Western ideas, Western liberal ideas of international order is not just coming from autocratic great powers like China and Russia. And this was the kind of main theme of last week's lecture. That challenge is also coming from inside the West. So um, if in the past we had a kind of centrist um, mainstream consensus between kind of center left and center right political leaders and political parties about liberal democracy within Western societies and an international order of kind of liberal internationalism, kind of aspiration to a, um, a globalized world uh, of international rules and norms and values uh, um, modeled on kind of uh, the liberal values of the West. <clears throat> well, that idea is being challenged in the West also. It's being challenged from the radical right. Um, uh, you see examples on the screen in the United States, Donald Trump, you see image, an image of leaders from France as well, Marine Le Pen, um, by leaders who, um, uh, who uh, you know, feel that this liberal uh, uh, international order is a threat to both the ethnic identity of nations and also the sovereignty of nations. Um, and you have a challenge from the radical left, politicians like the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in the US, or you know, in this example from France, Jean-Luc Jean Mélenchon, radical left leader in France, who think that this idea of kind of Western uh, uh, liberal democracy, globalization uh, on, based on a kind of neoliberal idea um, is really about the kind of spread of Western power uh, and Western capitalism. Um, and the West is a kind of a inherently a racist uh, uh, um, and uh, um, exploitative uh, political entity. And they're not and they don't really uh, uh, back the kind of spread of Western power. Um, uh, as justified by uh, the kind of spread of, of what centrist in the, in, the, in the West would consider kind of spread of liberal democracy. So we have a challenge both within Western societies about how Western societies should be, but also it's a challenge about the role that Western societies should play uh, in the wider world. So we have these big internal challenges, and these also affect attitudes towards Israel. This is one of the things we discussed last week, and we have this increasing polarization um, on the... Uh, we tend to find the further to the left you go in the political spectrum of Western states, um, the, the more chance that uh, people are going to going to see Israel as kind of an extension of this kind of malign Western uh, um, neo-imperialism, neo uh, and malign Western influence in the world, a part of kind of Western uh, uh, oppression and exploitation. And if you move to further to the right, we see increasingly, and even on the radical right, uh, whereas once we might have expected to see 
anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism today, further to the right, we tend to see support for Israel and seeing Israel or framing Israel as kind of an extension of the ethnic identity or cultural identity of the West, a kind of Judeo-Christian vision of what the West stands for. Um, and uh, so we see this sharp polarization uh, of the attitudes towards Israel. And we see that, of course, in the context of the terrible uh, 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 conflict that erupted with Hamas's awful attack uh, on the seventh uh, on the seventh of October. So that was kind of big theme from last week. And you and uh, in terms of how Israel responds to these uh, uh, dramatic changes globally and within the West, um, we talked about how the responses of it within Israel are polarized, and they're polarized because Israeli society is deeply polarized. And I talked briefly about the different levels, the different layers of the deep polarization within the state of Israel. We talked about the, I talked about the immediate political crisis. Um, I talked about how the immediate political crisis sits within a deep lying social and ideological divide about what kind of society Israel should be, the extent to which it should be, should be shaped by Jewish ethnic identity or Orthodox Jewish religious uh, values, and the extent to which it should, be, should be, it, it should be shaped by values, universalist kind of values of liberal democracy. And that crisis inside Israel sits within a, cri a global crisis of liberal democracy uh, that, that I just mentioned, this kind of all, this, this um, decline of consensus about values in Western societies with the rise of the radical left and radical right that we see in Western societies all over the world. So that divide in Israel affects how Israel responds to all kinds of policy dilemmas, both domestic and international, but obviously the theme of this course is very much the international. So that's very briefly, that was last week. So this week we're talking about, uh, last week we talk, spoke about the divide in the West and this week we're talking at the global level about this notion of great power competition and how that affects Israel and how Israel responds. So um, as Ari mentioned, I like to throw in some kind of quiz questions along the way. And here's my first one. So I'm gonna, th I'm gonna show in a moment an image on the screen. It's an image of, um, of port facilities in Haifa. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the image now. Um, and you can see there are a number of different port facilities in Haifa. You can see a, a military installation, the Israeli Navy port. You can see therefore there the Haifa port, which is the older port in um, Haifa. And you can see there are also a new port facility called Bay Port. And there's also something else there, the Israel Shipyards port. But I'm focusing here on the Haifa port and the Bay port. Now, both Haifa Port and Bay Port um, have uh, two uh, have um, companies uh, that are not Israeli, very very much involved in the operation of both of those ports. And the quiz question is: Can anybody does anybody know? Can anybody guess which non-Israeli nations or states are inherently involved, or companies from those states are deeply involved in the operation of either Haifa Port? Or Bay Port, and you can just drop your answers into the uh, into the uh, into the chat there. Okay, I see I see uh, I see the answers coming straight away. Four or five people have said China. There's a guess of Britain as well. <clears throat> Historically, Britain would be uh, would be that would be a, a correct answer. But uh, okay, so and I've had a guess for the USA. Okay, so China is one of the countries that I'm thinking of, but there is another one that has not yet been guessed. So I'm going to give just 10 seconds for anybody that wants to jump in, make themselves a star by guessing the second country <clears throat> that is deeply involved in the operation of either of those ports. <clears throat> Egypt, Turkey, no. Uh, good guesses, good guesses. Ah, the UAE, that's an interesting guess. We're going to talk about the UAE. Um, but the correct answer is that I'm thinking of is, in fact, India. OK, so what's the story here? OK, so uh, uh, Bayport, which is the, the newer port, is um, operated under a license uh, by a Shanghai based Chinese company. So those of you guess China, that was one of that was one of them. Um, it's not owned by the, the port is not owned uh, by the Chinese company, but the Chinese company is um, has a license to, to run that port. It was a very uh, controversial decision in the United States when Israel, uh, when that license was granted to a Chinese-based company a few years ago. The, um, um, and if you recall, when I 
discuss briefly this Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, these Chinese investments in, in global infrastructure and transportation routes, uh, railways, bridges, ports, uh, that, uh, that China is investing in all over the world. It kind of fits with what we know about China, um, that it has a significant stake in Haifa, which is an important, an important port. Um, um, but the other uh, uh, company, the other country involved here is India. So um, in 2022, Haifa port was actually sold to a consortium led by an Indian company. There's also an Israeli company involved, but the lead uh, the lead company in the consortium that bought Haifa port is an Indian is an Indian company. Um, okay, we're going to come back. Uh, to talk a little bit about more about China. And first of all, I'm going to talk about India. And then we're also going to talk about, about Russia. But um, this is just an introduction or, or a kind of an opener to flag up this kind of notion of uh, great powers, rising powers who are increasingly involved in important uh, global infrastructure, uh, a competition uh, uh, in some senses to dominate um, an influence and control key global trade routes. Um, and the fact that India and China are both very much involved in the in the Haifa port um, is just the first indication of that and of an indication that Israel is 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 in play as part of the story here in terms of this uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of this uh, uh, competition between between great powers in the world uh, over uh, trade routes, resources and uh, uh, um, an infrastructure. Um, so, okay, we'll come, come back to talk a little bit more about India that I've already mentioned, but let, uh, sorry, to talk about China, but let's just think a little bit about India. So if we think about India in relation to China, uh, India is kind of quite a long way behind in terms of this um, great power competition for economic size and um, global influence. Um, but, um, uh, you know, and if we can, you know, if we think about that, gargantuan investment of China in this Belt and Road project building all over the world, um, you know, India is so, some way behind China in that respect. But India is also thinking about how it upgrades its access to the energy it needs, how it upgrades its capacity to uh, get energy in, to get its export out uh, to the rest of the world, how it gets moves its exports out to the West. Um, and that helps us to understand uh, another interesting map um, um, that I'm going to show you now. And again, we'll do this as a kind of a quiz question. I'm going to, I'm going to flash up a, um, two images on the next slide. Uh, and they're both uh, referring to or a, the same thing. Um, there's a red line on both of these images. And the question is, what is that red line? It has a specific name. And I wonder if anybody can tell us what it is. So here are the two images. On the top left, you see the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's making a speech to the UN General Assembly just uh, exactly a year ago. Um, and uh, uh, he's drawn a line on a map there in his speech. And in the map, you see the bottom right hand corner. Uh, you also see a red line. And that red line is the same. You know, it's alluding to the same thing. But what what is it? What is Netanyahu drawing on that map? Does anybody know? I'm going to give a few more seconds. I see the answer rail transport across Israel, which is which is uh, correct in a way, uh, but there's something specific. Oil routes is um, a good guess, and it's related to energy, but it has a specific name. Pipeline and bypass Suez Canal, all of those are relevant. Um, but but uh, let me explain why and how. So this is something called the India... Um, uh, Middle East Europe corridor. Okay, it's a specific project with a specific name. Um, and um, what is it? It's an idea to link India to Europe with a uh, network of sea lanes and overland routes, which will include rail routes that will go through the UAE. We mentioned the UAE before, and I, I tell you why, I can now, you understand why it becomes relevant through the UAE, through Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Israel to Haifa, and then on to Greece. Okay, that's the route. And the idea is that you'll have trade going backwards and forwards along this route. 
but also that you'll have a fiber optic cable, cable, so digital connectivity and energy pipelines as well. And the big vision is the idea that you could produce clean energy, clean gas in hydrogen form using massive solar energy fields in the Arabian Peninsula, which is like the ideal place in terms of capturing the sun energy. Um, and then you could pipe this clean hydrogen energy uh, both to India uh, and to Europe along, along these routes as well. So it's a massive vision. Uh, it obviously depends on a big step change in integration in the Middle East. And that's the topic of next week. So we'll talk more about what it means in Middle East politics and how it might relate to what happened in October the 7th in the aftermath. That'll be next week's lecture. But here, we, for the moment, we're just kind of thinking about it from the perspective of the role of India for a moment. Um, and part of the significance of this is it does indeed bypass the Suez Canal, which is kind of an important trade route and, and can, will continue to be so. But it's also quite, you know, it's good to have alternatives. Uh, it also bypasses the Red Sea, which is a big issue right now, because since October the 7th, as you know, um, Houthis in Yemen have been attacking ships day in, day out in the Red Sea and have made it very problematic route. So this route would actually bypass that problem also by landing ships uh, in the UAE and then moving uh, uh, energy and goods um, uh, overland. So um, this, so the memorandum of understanding uh, relating to this India, Middle East, Europe corridor was signed at a G20 summit. Um, so a summit of 20, you know, uh, economically developed and industrialized nations that took place in India exactly a year ago, very much around the time that Netanyahu was making his speech to the UN General Assembly and just see What's going on at the signing ceremony happened in India, this G20 summit in India. This is a pretty impressive lineup here. Um, you see, going left to right, um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. You see Narendra Modi, the prime minister of India. You see Joe Biden, the president of the United States. You, you see Mohammed bin Zayed, the president of the UAE, and then uh, President Macron of France on the table as well. And there were others as well. But this is a high power table uh, putting their stamp um, on this vision. Uh, so uh, it's uh, no small, uh, no small deal. Um, OK, so um, what's the background is what's the context is what does it tell us about India uh, and it's in its global role and also its attitudes towards towards Israel. So um, I think it's worth reflecting a little bit. Um, and I do see questions are popping up on the screen, but Ari, maybe we'll hold the questions till 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 the end. Is that is that okay? Yeah, you, don't worry about the questions. I'll, I'll follow them. You focus, okay. and then we'll get there. All right, thank you. So, um, so um, you know, years ago, um, you know, we, we thought of India very much as um, as a, a strong diplomatic supporter of the Palestinians. Uh, you know, a leader of what we call the non-aligned movement uh, uh, during the Cold War. Um, in the wake of the end of the Cold War, India-Israel relations kind of improved, increasing ties between Israel and India, Israel selling defense equipment to India. And, but that was kind of a quiet improvement in, in the relationship. Um, but then uh, in 2017, we saw kind of an interesting step change in the India-Israel relationship when uh, Narendra Modi um, became the first Indian uh, prime minister to actually visit Israel and that visit uh, kind of looked like a like a big success and, and I can in illustrate that with the image you see on the screen right now you see the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this is back in 2017 wading into the Mediterranean Sea together it's a very charming photograph um, you can see there's kind of a warmth going on you know kind of they seem to hit it off uh, uh, and it, I think that that visit reflected a few things I think it reflected Israel's rising status in the world, it reflected the improvement between Israel and Arab states, even before the uh, breakthrough of the Abraham Accords that we'll talk more about next week. Um, I think it reflected the very strong support for Israel from the Trump administration and also a good relationship between Modi and Trump. It may also have reflected a kind of um, affinity between certain styles of leader, um, both Modi and Netanyahu increasingly had kind of ethno-nationalist uh, uh, leaders, uh, both of the kind of uh, sort of populist leaning, certainly uh, more, more so recently in the case of Netanyahu, and both 
with a hostility also towards political Islam, which is, of course, is threatening to India as it is to Israel. So several kind of overlapping things there. So um, certain uh, uh, uptick in the warmth of relations between uh, Israel and India. And then in 2022, shortly before the announcement of, uh, well, actually a year or so before the announcement of this proposal of the India Middle East Europe uh, corridor, uh, there was this summit that you see indicated by the image on the on the screen now. Um, and again, perhaps we'll do this a very quick pop quiz. This was the launch of something, as you see on the screen, called I2U2. Now, what is I2U2? There are some clues in the image there, but anybody indicate what I2U2 is? You know, you're free, free. Take a few seconds to pop an answer into the chat if you know what I2U2 is. Or maybe if I give you a clue, I2U2 indicates four countries. Which four countries are being indi are being uh, indicated by I two U two? USA, India, UAE, and not sure, but you've missed the easy one. You've got the hard three, but what's the fourth one? What's the second I? Uh, it is, of course, uh, Israel. Thank you very much. Well done. So, um, so yes, yeah, so the I two is is India and Israel, and the U two is the United States and the United Arab Emirates. Okay, so that's the I two U two. Yeah, very good. Exactly. That's those are the four the four states. It's nothing to do with the uh, famous spy plane or the Irish rock band. This is um, India, Israel, the United States, and the United Arab Emirates having a summit to launch this thing called I two U two. Now. Why do these four particular countries need a, some special framework or institution for cooperation? It kind of seems at first sight like a, like a little bit random. Um, what are these four countries, you know, got to do with each other in particular? Well, they announced all kinds of proposals that they had uh, to work together on clean energy, on space technology, on food technology, on climate change technology. They were going to support all kinds of cooperations. Uh, to support private investment in all these things. Um, um, but uh, on the same day that they um, launched this I2U2 uh, framework, uh, I see many, but yes, absolutely. So um, so the same day they launched this, this, this framework is the same day that it was announced that um, uh, Israel had approved the sale of Haifa port to a consortium, which includes this led by uh, this uh, Indian uh, Indian company. And if we think about what subsequently happened, the memorandum of understanding on the Indian Middle East Europe corridor, this idea, this vision, this proposal to create this link, the fact that um, um, India made this major investment in Haifa port, that they were building this kind of quad link with the UAE as well, which is the UAE is a pivotal country for this Middle East, Europe, India corridor, because in because the UAE is where the ships, where the uh, uh, or the ga gas pipelines are going to land before they head through Saudi Arabia. So it's geographically very, very important. Um, uh, it starts to make sense that we see the building of this kind of this kind of infrastructure, um, uh, both in terms of strengthening diplomatic relations, but also making the basis for integration uh in uh uh you know geopolitical significance in terms of trade routes energy routes to, uh, uh uh communications routes uh, uh uh and so on so and we see india through this dip diplomatic network through its investment in haifa port also trying to increase its influence and its role in the middle east which is an important potential historically and in the future conduit for energy trade and goods uh from india uh, to the West. So, but the fact that this was announced um, on uh, this day that Biden was in the United States, uh, with, was in Israel, this is an event happened in Israel, you see there also the then Prime Minister Yair Lapid. Um, uh, so the fact that this was announced while Biden was, was, was there in Israel at this summit shows that the, basically a kind of diplomatic stamp of approval from the United States for this major investment of India buying up this big port in Haifa, which is in st stark contrast to the US reaction to China 
uh, taking a major role in operating the uh, uh, the Haifa port, sorry, the Bayport uh, uh, complex. The U.S., especially the Trump administration, was not happy about the Chinese infrastructure investment in Israel, uh, particularly the port. Uh, you know, said at one point it was not going to allow U.S. Navy ships to dock at Haifa port because of the significant role of a Chinese company in operating uh, the Bayport facility. Um, also concerned about Chinese role in construction of Ashdod port, the Chinese role in constructing and providing trains to the Tel Aviv light rail. Um, and they said, uh, you know, so um, uh, and that's an indication that unlike Shi India, with respect to China, this, uh, there's a, high, a heightened sensitivity for the United States. So I think we also need to think about that. So we'll turn now from talking about India to talking about China, where there seems to be a much greater sensitivity from the U.S. perspective compared to the India perspective, where the U.S. is very quite keen to promote this kind of uh, integration and involvement of India. So let's think more about China. So China, along with Russia, poses a particular challenge for the US. China and Russia represent two non-democratic great power actors that are actively trying to sort of de-westernize the international political order. We saw that indicated in that summit of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin from a couple of years ago. And what does that mean for Israel? And how should Israel respond and approach uh, this, this particular tense rivalry or tense situation between both the US and Russia and the US and, and China. So let's think about Ch China uh, uh, for a moment because it's, it's particularly important. So um, China, the, China is, of course, the great rising power uh, of our time. The, the rivalry between China and the United States is perhaps the number one story of international relations uh, in, this, in, the current, in the current century. Um, and we can understand that we just sort of start to see some data and statistics about, about China and its rise. So um, just kind of rotate around these very quickly. The top left, you see a graph showing how Chinese GDP, how the size of the Chinese economy has over the last 30 years, you know, closed the gap very significantly with the size of the US economy, it's effectively overtaking the European Union economy, even though the EU has grown in the number of countries that are part of it. Um, uh, and though the US has kind of done well, I guess, in the last few years, according to that graph, you know, China has caught up significantly with the size of the US economy, and it's the second economy in the world only to the US. But it's not just economic size that is significant, and of course, population size. China is parallel with India. These are the two world's most populous countries, each has approximately 1.4 billion people. I think India, India is now overtaking China and China will decline. It's still a huge population. We also see economic size population, but in the top right-hand corner, you see a, a graph showing you who is filing the most patents for new technologies in the world in many, many different fields. And you can see, according to this research, that China is number one in 29 different fields, you can see some of them on the graph there, computer technology, electrical machinery, digital communications, medical technology. Now, the filing of patents, it's not a perfect measure of who is technologically most advanced. We don't know what these patents are or how useful they are, but it's an indicator that China is competing also on a technological level. It's not just a kind of producer of cheap goods for the West. Now, it's also a technological innovator in its own right, competing to to, to uh, dominate the technologies of the future. In educational attainment, this is the bottom left that you see on the graph there. It's uh, data from 2018. And again, the data is not perfect, but it shows you, in, in, at least according to one score, when they did an a international comparison of whose students have the highest attainment in literacy and maths and science, that China came top of the whole world. Now, they were only measuring certain areas of China, the wealthiest areas around Shanghai and Beijing and a couple of wealthy provinces. Um, so uh, it wasn't the whole of China's population. So the data is not, not so accurate, but it's an indicator, again, that even also on that level of educational attainment, China is competing uh, with the rest of the, of the world and certainly with, the, with Western states. And on the level of military spending, and this is the graph that you see in the bottom right hand corner, the top 15 defense budgets in 2023. This is data from the think tank IISS. The state that spends the most on military stuff is, of course, still by far the United States. 
But China, you can see in the red circle there, is closing the gap on that level. Also, it is closing the gap on defense spending. It's by far, it's, it's um, number two in the world in defense spending. And it is uh, working gradually to catch up and close the gap with the United States on uh, defense spending also. So this rise of China to rival the United States as the most powerful country on earth is the major, the big, big story of global affairs in our time. Um, and just to kind of illustrate that, a quotation from Lee Kuan Yew, who was the founder of modern Singapore, uh, knows China very well, quoted in uh, Graham Allison's 2016 book, Destined for War. He said, the size of China's displacement of the world balance is such that the world must find a new balance. It is not possible to pretend that this is just another big player. This is the biggest player in the history of the world. Um, so what does that mean, this search for a new balance? And why did Graham Allison, who's one of the leading um, scholars of international affairs in the United States um, uh, over the last 50 years, why has he written this book about the US-China relationship called Destined for War? This is a little bit uh, alarming. Uh, you'll see the subtitle, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? I'm not going to go into what he means by Thucydides' Trap, but just in summary, what he's saying is historically, when a, when a power is rising to rival the power of the most powerful state in an international system, very often what we see historically is the outcome is war between the number one power and the power that is rising to rival it as the number one power. We see that going back to ancient Greece, which is the Thucydides trap bit, but we also see it over the last 500 years, very often the outcome of that kind of situation of a rising power challenging a status quo power is war between those powers. So the big question, one of the big questions of international affairs today is, will this rivalry result in war? between the United States and China, as historical precedent might suggest, or can that be avoided? It doesn't always lead to war when you have this situation. Historically, you see cases where it did not lead to war. So the question is, how do you prevent this change in the global balance of power resulting, uh, resulting in war? Especially when you have all kinds of potential trigger points, and you guys in the US will be familiar with this. Um, one of the major ones, of course, is the question of Taiwan. This is a headline from the foreign policy magazine from earlier this year. How primed for war is China, they ask. And you see the subheading risk signals for conflict are flashing red. We see uh, China committed to extending its control over Taiwan, uh, apparently making preparations militarily to give it the option to do that. That's very sensitive for the US. Taiwan is an ally of the United States. So again, when we think about this competition for material stuff, who controls trade routes, energy sources, military technologies, military power. There's lots of triggers as well over which this kind of stuff could ignite. So what does that mean for Israel? How does Israel position itself in this glowing, growing great rivalry between the United States and China? Well, you might think from an Israeli perspective, this is kind of a no brainer, right? In the rivalry between the US and China, you know, the US has been Israel's great diplomatic economic, military supporter for, you know, since at least since the 1970s. And it's very clear that where Israel stands in any global rivalry between the US and China, the US stands with its great ally, sorry, Israel stands with its great ally, uh, the United States. But, um, and it might seem absurd that Israel would ever kind of play with that given how dependent Israel is on the US. But sometimes, you know, there's a question mark over that. So I'm going to flag that up with a few headlines here. One is something we've already alluded to in the top left-hand corner. Um, the US was not very happy about uh, letting China run Haifa port, as the headliner uh, runs there. And uh, those kind of things can cause friction. Um, you know, if Israel invites a kind of a big Chinese company to run a big piece of its important infrastructure, uh, and indeed did create some friction in the US uh, uh, Israel uh, relationship. Um, but not only that, look at the top right hand corner headline now. So um, what do you see here? You see um, uh, a headline, Netanyahu, this is from June 2023. So over a year ago, before the outbreak of the war, um, Netanyahu says he's invited to China 
emphasizes U.S. as Israel's key ally. What is this headline about? What was the context? This was a moment at the height of the protests in Israel over the planned judicial reform or judicial overhaul that, that opposition leaders in Israel were warning was going to undermine Israeli democracy. Round about that time, the Biden administration was also very concerned about that. And you, Netanyahu could barely get a phone call with Joe Biden at that time. Uh, Biden didn't want to speak to him, made very clear he did not want to welcome him to the White House. He was giving Netanyahu the big cold shoulder because of this anti-democratic legislation um, um, being promoted in Israel. And at the, at the absolute peak of that tension, uh, Netanyahu announces, oh, I've just been invited to uh, go and visit with Xi Jinping in China. Um, could be just coincidence, but I think many people would have read that as some kind of signal um, to the United States. Oh, you don't want me to come to Washington? You don't really want to have me in the White House? Uh, well, uh, this guy Xi Jinping in China, he doesn't seem all that concerned about um, uh, my uh, domestic legislation. Uh, he's not really bothered. Apparently, he's happy to invite me to China. And well, well, you know, I'll go and hang out with Xi Jinping in, 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 in Beijing. Um, uh, so, um, you know, um, for Netanyahu, dealing with, uh, you know, dealing with all this pressure coming from a U.S. democratic administration, you know, China has certain kind of advantages. They don't tend to bother you about democracy. They don't tend to bother you about human rights. Um, so maybe it was perhaps a message to, uh, uh, to Biden. Now, in the context of the current war, however, you know, if the idea was to kind of hint to the U.S., ah, we have options Israel, in Israel. We don't have to, you know, be totally dependent on the U.S., it's not looking like such a great bet over the last year. Uh, we've seen how, and this is alluded to in the headlines you see at the bottom here, China has actually uh, uh, used the war to kind of win supporters in the global south. It's taken a very different position from the US. It's kind of accused the US of being a warmonger in supporting Israel. It's called for a ceasefire. It's tried to take what it describes as a balanced posture in contrast to the US. So um, much less friendly diplomatic position from China. Uh, than from the US, of course. And also we've seen a surge in Chinese social media, both in China and in platforms like TikTok, which are owned by Chinese company, huge surges in anti-Semitic content also. So, um, you know, that kind of idea of, oh, well, you know, maybe we have other, other great powers that we can turn to uh, doesn't look uh, uh, quite so strong uh, in the context of the, uh, of, of, of the last year. Um, and it might also be said, we might also say a similar thing about, about Russia. Let, let's turn to Russia, Russia now. Um, okay. Russia is also a very important power. It's, it's a power that's rising. It's not a power rising to match the power of the US in the way that China is. It's a relatively weak economy, has a declining population, but it stays it, always very important because of its size, its military power, its natural resources, particularly energy resources. Um, and when Russia invaded Ukraine, it made every country in the world take a stance, right? How far to go with aligning with what has been a sort of US and EU led campaign to punish Russia and to help uh, Ukraine. Um, and every country's had to, had to wrestle with that, with that question. In Britain, where I am, there hasn't been that much of a, of a deep debate about that. Um, both the mainstream left and the mainstream right party have had a strong consensus, you see this, illustrated at the top of your screen. In Britain, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party had a strong consensus about being all in in support of Ukraine. Uh, and that sort of, you know, reflects a traditional British view. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the Americans in defense of liberal democracy and for the rule of law and that kind of thing. Um, so in Britain, and that's partly because the radical left and radical right are relatively marginalized in the UK right now, it's not been very controversial. Also for mainstream EU states, there's been a consensus in support of Ukraine in defense of Russia. And like Britain, you know, for European uh, Union states, they're concerned to stand up democracy, but also to protect the security of Europe, uh, to protect the security of NATO members. Most EU members are also NATO members. Um, and if Russia can invade Ukraine, then maybe a NATO member in Europe uh, could be next. <clears throat> but it's not universal, this support. And that's also indicated by the headline you see at the bottom. Uh, the EU approves 50 billion for Ukraine aid as Viktor Orban folds, it's indicating that the Prime Minister of Hungary that I mentioned last week, populist nationalist or uh, um, conservative nationalist leader Viktor Orban, was not so enthusiastic. And he was about giving money for Ukraine, much as the right 
some on the right in the United States are questioning the wisdom of giving uh, financial and economic and monetary support to Ukraine. We find on the radical right in both the, the, the US and in, and in Europe, some who are saying, um, you know, why should we waste our energy and our resources uh, helping out Ukraine? Why should we pay more for our gas uh, to help out Ukraine? You know, we're having to, you know, not, you know, not buy uh, Russian gas. Suddenly our, our energy is a lot more expensive, certainly in Europe. Uh, or we're spending billions and billions and sending it to Ukraine. Why don't we just cut a deal with Putin? Why do we need to waste our, our resources? And you can see that in a headline. Uh, this is Trump, Donald Trump in June. Trump uh, threatens to cut US aid to Ukraine quickly if re-elected. This is a quotation from Trump, Trump, a speech he said. He just left four days ago. He's talking about uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, with 60 billion. And he gets home and he announces he needs another 60 billion. It never ends. So... There is a challenge on the radical right in Europe and in the US uh, about this global role. Now, where does that leave Israel? Where does Israel stand in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine? Is it all in in support of Ukraine? Is it questioning support of Ukraine? Is it saying we should kind of just get along better with Russia? The answer to that question inside Israel depends on where you stand, it seems to me, on this internal divide in Israel about Israel's own identity. And I can illustrate that with what you see on the screen here. Um, you saw a significant difference, I would argue, between the position of Yair Lapid when he was prime minister in Israel and um, the position of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Lapid openly condemned Putin. Uh, you see the tweet at the top of the screen there. He strongly condemned Russia. Um, Netanyahu criticized him for condemning Putin in the context uh, uh, of the war. Now, you have to keep in mind, Relations between Israel and Russia are sensitive, particularly because of the Russian military position in Syria and also significant Jewish minority stood in Russia today. But still, we noted a significant difference between Lapid, that was much more aligned with Western liberal centrist liberal uh, leaders in condemning Putin and Netanyahu, who was much more cautious, didn't really want to offend, offend Putin. And I think that reflects the deep divide we see in Israel between those on the center left that see Israel as being inherently a liberal democratic state, part of the Western alliance of liberal democracies, and that should be aligned, you know, if those countries are coming together to support Ukraine against Russia, that that's what Israel should be. And on the right, there is a different set of priorities, less concern or commitment for liberal democracy inside Israel, but also in less of an idea of Israel being part of a kind of liberal internationalist Western liberal alliance um, that should support values of, uh, you know, uh, international law or a liberal international order, because those values, though, though the strength of that order can also be a challenge to the Israeli right. For example, um, you know, if uh, states have a strong sense of international human rights norms, that can mean putting pressure on Israel over the Palestinian issue, putting pressure on the Israeli government over challenges it's making to, towards liberal democracy uh, in inside Israel. So we see how Israel responds, whether it's with respect to Russia or China, to these dilemmas, I think, depends a lot on this divide, this ideological divide uh, in Israel um, between these the different camps and different visions of what Israel is and what kind of state uh, Israel should be. OK, I'm going to pause there and give a chance for for questions. Thank you. You know, we, we are, we've been so busy here, obviously, in the last 11 months, focused on October 7th and before that, focused on the judicial issue that I don't know how many of us were really focused on some of the stuff that you brought up. Um, maybe Mike Rubin, who reads way more than I do, knew about all this stuff, but I certainly didn't. So thank you for sharing it. I guess one of the questions I, I've seen in the chat is, how much is Israel just in the middle of everything? And how much is Israel driving things? So is Israel looking at the world order and saying, ah, we can actually play a role here and get you know serious benefits by attracting China and attracting India to the ports in Haifa and by negotiating with the UAE and, you know, being involved in this corridor? And how much is is it that Israel just happens to be in the right location, in the right place with the right people and technology, and therefore it's being approached by the other powers to be involved in these um, relationships? That's a really good question. I think that the second element of that, you know, I don't think we can entirely separate between those two elements in the sense that um, Israel's geographic position is defining in the role that it can play in this uh, in this uh, great power competition. Israel, as it just so happens, 
is in a really significant uh, geographical position. It really can play the, uh, uh, the, the role of one of the points of physical linkage between East and West, which is a phenomenal opportunity. And we'll talk more about it next week. I think we'll talk about the Middle East. That, that, that we sh in my mind, at least, we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the opportunity if there was integration between greater integration between Israel and Arab states, what that could mean in terms of making Israel a kind of real bridge between, uh, between East and West. The capacity of Israeli leaders to capitalize on or exploit the opportunity also depends on these wider questions. And Netanyahu was a big champion of this Indian Middle East Europe corridor, of course, of normalization with Arab states. But what we're discovering, what we're seeing, certainly in the context of last, the last year, is that the Palestinian question cannot be disconnected from these issues. If Israel wants normalization with Saudi Arabia, it's going to have to at least calm down, if not settle, the Palestinian question. And that come back, comes back to the heart of the identity issue within the state of Israel. So Netanyahu is kind of hoping to have his cake and eat it. It's looking much less likely that he can do that now. And so that's going to be one of the big debates in Israel, I think, uh, going forward. And you already see it in the debate between le center left and right in Israel on a question of how to end the current war. I remember reading earlier, and I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, that one of the reasons that Hamas decided to attack was that it was looking around at this rapidly changing new world order, particularly with Israel and the UAE, and maybe Israel, UAE, and this corridor, was very upset with what was happening and felt that it had to do something. It does that, did that, in fact, play a role in, from your perspective, as to why Hamas attacked when it did? Look, Not in the, the date, we... but, but general attack. Yeah, look, and, uh, there's a limitation. We can't read Sinwar's mind and know exactly which of several motives was the dominant one or the most important one. But if we listen to the words of Hamas leaders that spoke and explained, this is why we did this. For example, Ismail Haniya, now dead, of course, now, uh, but um, he made a speech, uh, the Hamas leader, uh, former Hamas leader in Qatar, on October the 7th, where he basically said, you know, this is why this is happening. And one of the first things he spoke about is or alluded to, referred to was the normalization between Israel and Arab states. Um, he didn't refer to the Indian Middle East Europe corridor explicitly, although it may have been a factor. And these things are inherently linked together. But he basically said he addressed Arab states and he said, you Arab leaders that thought you could sell out to Israel, you wanted to bank your future prosperity uh, on Israel and the United States, look how weak we just made Israel look. You're backing the wrong horse. You're making a big mistake. So clearly that changing regional dynamic was a significant element of this. My, in my view, and again, this will be more of a focus next week, that Hamas, when it launched that attack, was looking regional. It was a regional strategic act, not just about the Gaza Strip itself. And yet I think, this is a side discussion, <laughs> we've seen that these economic relationships that were created led to protection of Israel when Israel was attacked, for example, by Iran, um, and the countries around have protected Israel. So there's something else going on as well, right? So there's something very remarkable about how enduring the Abraham Accords have been, uh, in the sense that you know, no, no, neither um, the UAE or Bahrain or Morocco have like have renounced or reversed their normalization uh, with Israel. And relations have become very tense. And yes, in the context of that April 13th Iranian attack, attack on Israel, we saw the practical cooperation uh, between Israel and those, and those Arab states. So there's something very enduring uh, about that strategic cooperation, but to fully realize the potential of this cooperation, uh, of course, that, that the, in terms of some things like the India, Middle East, Europe corridor, normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, that cannot be disconnected, it seems, from addressing, uh, uh, the, the, in some sense, the Palestinian question. And I saw a question or two about the role that Iran is now playing in in everything you just told us about. Is Iran the, the, the um, um, trying to be the, uh, the spoiler? Is Iran yes. basically... It's not just an issue about Palestinians and what's going on in Gaza for them. It's this, 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 this. Basically, they're left out of this whole thing, right? So, um, are they in, intended? Are they intentionally trying to be the spoilers? And right now, I assume 
everything that's going on, particularly with Iran, is is threatening this whole um, corridor. Idea. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll zoom on this next week when we talk on talk about the Middle East. But yes, this entire this um, the Middle East component of this vision, which entails integration between Israel and Arab states, and Arab states opening up their economies, uh, and some have already done so, and some wish to do so, like Saudi Arabia is trading behind the UAE and wants to catch up, being open to the West and um, uh, open to Israel and having much more liberal social models and much more liberal economic models. Um, this is uh, in inherently threatening to Iran. I mean, it contradicts Iran's core ideology, which considers Western cultural influence to be toxic um, uh, and anti-Islamic, but it also threatens, of course, the status of the regime in Tehran. If um, Iranians can see uh, how Arab states can get along with Israel and prosper economically and build open societies and uh, liberalize their, um, their social models and, and um, liberalize rights for women, even in Saudi Arabia potentially, then that of course, where, where, Iranian, where the Iranian regime is suppressing women that just want the right to remove head coverings, this is extremely threatening for the Iranian regime and Iran and its network of proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis in Yemen and others are fighting in a, a coordinated um, uh, um, a battle to undermine that. And that's part of what this war is about. Absolutely. It is partly about undermining uh, and making that kind of integration process between Israel and Arab states impossible, undermining Israeli security undermining Israeli deterrence, undermining confidence in Israel's future. Um, and that's what this part, a big part of what this uh, war is about. It's about the future of the Middle East. What kind of values will shape the region uh, going forward? What will be the place of Israel? What will be the place of the US and its vision and the status of, uh, of uh, US allies in the region? A few, a few more questions. Um, you mentioned how Russia is, um, Kind of, uh, is out there in the world talking about Israel and Gaza, supporting, I would say, Gazans. You mentioned the Chinese and kind of what's going on in the background with TikTok and stuff like that. But you didn't mention India. What is How has India been responding to the war in Gaza? Yes, I think India's taken a, you know, uh, um, a slightly more nuanced and balanced position. And it's balancing between, uh, you know, um, different competing, I think, social factors uh, and different kind of geopolitical interests as well. And I suppose it's taking more its traditional kind of non-aligned, uh, uh, more neutral posture. Um, uh, I don't think it's given the kind of uh, overt diplomatic support to Hamas uh, that Russia has, uh, uh, for example, um, but it's not perhaps, but it's not certainly not backing Israel in the way that United, the United States is. So I think it's a, you know, in this perhaps similar to the position on Russia, Ukraine, um, it's not come out, I don't think, in an, it, perhaps as we might have expected in, in decades gone past, in its support of the Palestinians and condemnation of Israel at the level of, of, of uh, that we might have expected previously. I think it's kind of uh, taking a, a more kind of, a, let's say, a, a, a middle road. You talked about I2U2, which obviously includes the United States, but it seems like the United States actually left out of this whole corridor that you talked about. And if this car, I, I don't know where this whole corridor is in kind of its construction at the moment is it is it like something that is just envisioned or is it actually under construction and what does the u.s get out of that so obviously i think it it's it's a vision but certain elements of it already are, you know it's a vision that builds on certain things that already exist um the you know indian uh, stake in haifa port is, is an example of that some of the connectivity already exists the very close relationship between india and the uae is 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 there, um, but it, you know it needs to be built on and expanded, and you know a lot of investments need to go in place. Certainly, the energy pipelines and that whole vision about clean energy, and that that's that's more down the line. For the U.S., the U.S. is very invested in this vision. Um, uh, a few weeks after the war broke out on October the seventh, um, President Biden wrote an op-ed. I think it was in the Washington Post, where he alluded to this vision and linked it directly to what had happened on October the seventh. Um, for the U.S., it's very much in its interests to uh, improve relations and integration between its allies in the region, that's, which is to say Israel and its Arab allies uh, in the region. It's very much in its interests to create 
corridors of connectivity and infrastructure uh, uh, and connectivity, which is not dominated by China. And this is, in a sense, a, a rival to the Belt and Road may be not quite right because these things can exist together, you know, um, uh, uh, and, but an alternative perhaps. So um, uh, that's very much in, in, in US uh, interest and to kind of try to integrate or incorporate uh, a, a, you know, a resolution uh, or a, a um, um, management, at least, or a stabilization of the Palestinian component very much in U.S. Uh, interest. Also, certainly from the perspective of a kind of, um, of, a, of a sort of centrist, traditional kind of more or less centrist leader like, like Biden in the United States. Right. So that's why you saw Biden there at the signing ceremony. The U.S. is kind of involved in as a catalyst trying to pull these players together. And it sees us very much as part of its vision for the region, which, of course, has been catastrophically disrupted by the war over the last year. Yeah, th thank you for that explanation. I guess um, last question was just, um, you uh, made everyone worried by sharing the book about um, uh, Destined for War. So thank you so much. Something that we need to all now deal with today. Um, and I guess the question that some people have asked is, do you think we are destined for war? I, it doesn't seem like China has its sights on coming to conquer the United States or Europe militarily. Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, in the old days, we all thought Russia was going to come and get us. So just, that, that was a question for you. Does Toby yeah. Green worry about China <laughs> coming to, uh, attack Europe and the United States and so on? So, so Alice, uh, if I remember rightly, Alison, uh, presents in his, in his uh, 16 cases, uh, in the last 500 years in which a, um, rising power has come to rival the power of the kind of existing dominant power in the system, in the international system. And I think he says in, I can't remember the, the numbers correctly, nine or 11 of the 16 cases, the outcome was war. So war is not inevitable. And one of the challenges is to okay, work out, okay, which cases, in which cases was the result war? And in which cases was war prevented? And what conditions can prevent this combustible conditions leading condition leading to to war so it's not inevitable no i don't believe it's inevitable but i believe the risk is there part of um allison's thesis is that war can erupt between two rival powers even if neither really intends for there to be a war because of friction that emerges sometimes to do with the actions of the third party third party or uh over a, you know a, a, a relatively small issue um can lead great powers into war. The first, the eruption of the First World War is a classic example. In 1914, either Britain or Germany had the intention to go to war with one another, but an issue in the Balkans led to a series of escalations. And before they knew it, they were kind of dragged into a confrontation with one another. So whether it's Korea, whether it's Taiwan, there are these flashpoints that exist that could drag these two powers into a war that neither one actually consciously um, uh, wants or is, or is looking for. So the risk is there. And the challenge is how to ameliorate that risk and prevent that risk being real. Yeah, well, it looks like Mike Rubin's going to have to have a strong drink now after this presentation. So thank you so much. It's really early here in California for that. Okay, I think that's it for our question. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we have any time left. We're kind of in overtime, but I turn it back to you for anything else you'd like to end with. Me, I'm. I uh, no, thank you very much. You're for done. Then, you've 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 made us all worried, and now you've done your job, so you can go no, get come a back pint next and, week. And <laughs> okay, come back next week. Uh, you want to give us a quick no, uh, so trailer? Is, so as not to leave on, on a on a on a note of concern, and this will be the theme next week. Um, what I what what I see if we focus back on the Israel picture, certainly pre October the seventh was a moment of an immense immense opportunity for Israel. Um, this uh, this this potential for integration between Israel and Arab states, you know, that we saw also a glimpse through the, the breakthrough of the Abraham Accords and this proposal of this Indian Middle East Europe corridor um, and the apparent willingness of Saudi Arabia to normalize relations with Israel uh, that the U.S. is working very, very hard to broker and has even during the context of the war been trying to keep alive and try to link to the end of the war, um, you know, is, uh, I believe, presents immense, immense opportunity uh, for the state of Israel. The actions of Iran, Hamas, that axis has very been, much been designed 
in no small part to disrupt that opportunity, but the opportunity still exists, even in spite of the catastrophic war. But it will require uh, um, uh, certain kind of leadership, arguably a different kind of leadership in Israel to realize that opportunity. Um, and next week, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. And uh, thank you all for sticking with us a little over time. We'll be back next week for more. We have more CSP coming up this week. Take care. I'm not sure people should be destined for war, but if you, is it a good book? Is it worth reading, Toby? Sure. I mean, there's, yes, I mean, there's lots, lots of books, a lot of books out there about China. No, but I mean, it's destined for relations. But Graham Allison is, uh, you can't do much, you can't, uh, you can't go do much better. Okay. I vote that Robert Olish, he reads it for the group. He'll send me like a, just uh, maybe a two or three page summary. I'll share with everybody. Take care, everybody. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.